So good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to today's Ethic Media Services Weekly National News Briefing. I'm Sunita Sarabji, and I'm your moderator for today. Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders are the fastest growing voter electorate. More than 15 million AANHPIs will be eligible to vote on Election Day, November 5th, including many first-time voters. In battleground states, AANHPIs could constitute the margin of victory if they get out to vote. We have a distinguished panel of speakers today. They are Shaker Narasimhan, founder and chairman of the AAPI Victory Fund, Mohan Sishadri, executive director of the Asian Pacific Islander Political Alliance, Christine Chen, co-founder and executive director of APIA Vote. Professor James Zarsa Diaz, associate professor of history and director of the Eugenco Philippine Studies Program at the University of San Francisco. Dr. Tang Wen, president of Pivot, the progressive Vietnamese American organization and Republican strategist, Rina Shah, who will join us towards the end of our briefing today. We will send a video of today's briefing along with expanded bios for each speaker later on today. We will also send video excerpts of the presentation early next week and we encourage you to use those on your social media channels. Reporters, please enter your questions in the chat box. We will go to a three minute Q&A immediately after each speaker presents. So now, we begin with Shaker Narasimhan, who will give us an overview of the importance of the get out the vote for AH, AANHPIs in swing states. Shaker is in Michigan and he's going to offer us a perspective from the state. Welcome Shaker. Thank you, Sunita, and very glad to be here. Um, and yes, I'm actually in Detroit sitting in a home and sitting in the room above me are Congressman Ro Khanna and Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist of Michigan. And literally they are talking to young people, influencers and creators from the Asian Pacific, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander communities. Um, we tend to bring young people together, black and brown of every ethnicity and faith and have conversations that can then go viral on social media so that in fact, we are reaching constituencies that otherwise normally never get reached. What you should know about the AANHPI vote is that first of all, it is very significant. I prefer actually, instead of saying that we are the margin of victory to saying now we, that we are the reason for victory. And let me give you the data that proves that. In the seven battleground states, which for our reporters are Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. In those seven states that will basically determine uh, the presidency of the United States where the electoral votes um, matter the most, doesn't mean electoral votes don't matter everywhere, they matter the most in these seven, we have approximately 1.75 million eligible a NHPI voters. The total victory margin in 2020 in the presidential in these seven states was 385,000, number one. Number two, in the three states that were the closest, Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin, the total margin of victory was 45,000. In each of those states, the NHPI vote, even if it was 3% or 4% has been material to the outcomes of these elections. So I'm going to tailor my remarks a little bit around Michigan because it has one of the most diverse ANHPI communities and one of the fastest growing as well. Because with the advent of AI robotics and the reimagination of the car industry around EVs, there has really been a very significant influx, particularly of South Asians. So in fact, Michigan is one of those states and Christine is the expert in a lot of this. So she can give you this data as well, but there are well over 23,000 
AANHPIs, particularly Indian Americans who became citizens between 21 and 24. Our job is when people turn 18, they become citizens, they move into a state, find them, talk to them, discuss the issues at hand first, figure out how they can get into that civic engagement ladder, which includes getting registered to vote, then actually going to the voting booth. And, and our job, is, to an extent, frankly, is to make sure we first find them and talk to them. Because guess what? In 2020, which was the most virtual campaign, and, and ANHPIs are among the most active on social media and uh, using uh, co computers, and computers and automation. Even in that year, almost half our community was not reached directly by a campaign. There are many reasons for this. One of which is, uh, I suspect strongly, they don't know how to talk to us, which language to reach, which communities to talk to, the WhatsApp channels that we frequent, or the television or uh, media, or the ethnic reporters that are on this call. They're not sure how to be reached by you and therefore, there is an absence of information. So we have what we call low information borders. How do you address that? You address that by going and talking to them. So the one thing we tell every candidate is show up in our communities, talk to our voters, and don't just talk to them around election time. Second, talk to them about the issues that matter to this community. As an example, among the issues that are the most important are small business capital formation. How do we get credit for what we've done and how do we access resources? Uh, immigration, the fact that it takes 18 years to get a visa, the fact that uh, people are still waiting in queues, the fact that there's such a significant undocumented cohort within our communities, well over 1.3 million uh, ANHPIs who are treated as undocumented or has visas have expired. How do we address these issues while at the same time, not just in a humane manner, but through public policy. And then we move people to start talking about to make public policy, we need people in positions of power to make that policy. We need people like you working for people like them so we can talk about our issues. Now, bottom line, Michigan, three access points. Over half the community is South Asian. Yes, there are plenty of issues that dominate right now. Uh, in addition to the economy and immigration and education, uh, certainly the issues around Israel and Gaza are significant in Michigan. How are we talking about these? Uh, we bring people here, like Congressman Ro Khanna, uh, you know, Lieutenant Governor Galvin Ginstrick, the Senate candidate Elisa Slotkin, and our recommendation is open the door and have the conversation. You may not have the solution and you can't tell people who are emotionally engaged not to worry. They will worry, they will care, but deal with it, address it, and then do your very best to try to listen and say what you can that is not just empathetic, but says, how can I address your concern? And this is in every facet. So teaching the people that our community wants people to show up, engage with them, talk to them about their issues, care about them after the election. And so accountability after the election is equally important. We do like to go back and when we knock on doors and talk to people in community halls, we're doing a town hall tomorrow with hundreds of South Asians in the room, open air, questions can just be written down and, answer, and asked, uh, no holds barred, just good behavior. That's all we're requesting in the room. And bottom line, I believe that that's how people go back and talk in their communities and in their families and say to each other, there is an openness to the conversation. This matters. This election matters because one, two, three. So simply put, this election matters because it not just determines the future of who's in the White House, but the excitement generated by having someone whose mother was born in India, so has roots in uh, India, in South Asia, in Asia, a significant Every time we now hold a meeting and we say that we're going to have 50 people, we have 150. Every time we open up the door and say we need volunteers, we're getting six times as many as we did in 2020 or in 2016. So where exactly is the campaign with regard to all this? And the answer to that is the campaign is very much investing in our community, 
in all these states, there are battleground coordinators, there are ANHPI coordinators, and we work alongside them to make sure that we're all talking together to our communities and encouraging the local electeds, the state electeds, those running for office to show up along with surrogates as well as the candidate herself and the vice presidential candidate as himself. Um, let me stop there and see what kind of questions I can respond to, Sunita, if that makes sense. We're going to start with a question from uh, EMS uh, uh, editor, Pilar Marrero. Pilar, please ask your question. Um, hi, hi everyone. I think uh, the speaker um, addressed it, but I'm not sure he gave us a whole picture. Um, so every, every presidential election year, we hear the same thing. Yes, they're looking at our communities, they're, they're gonna you know, focus on our vote, they want us to turn out. The problem is always money. You put are, are you putting money in the turning out, in the registering of voters, and in, in things that are tangibly making a difference in turning out communities? And a the AAPI community <coughs> obviously is, is gonna be crucial for the Democratic presidential candidate. Where, where, is, where is the beef? Where is the evidence that this is happening? <laughs> so uh, great question, Pilar. Let me answer it two ways. Um, and the glass is always going to be half full, OK? Um, it, it, one is there's a deliberate effort to do this. And you could see it starting in 16. It's grown in 20. And it's grown even more in 24 with the excitement in our communities about the top of the ticket. But is it enough? The two questions, they are doing it. They are absolutely trying. Uh, we have full participation with the campaign and all the events we're doing, we're participating with them at every launch that they're doing, particularly in the states where we're active right now, which is uh, Michigan and Georgia. But is it enough? Is it commiserate with the need and the desire of our community to engage? Look, I'm always gonna complain about that, okay? Um, but to some extent, the organizations that are on this call and the people working on it, whether we're volunteers or we have paid staffs, that's what we do also. We fill the gap. We see where the need exists and we dive in. Um, we do not hesitate to go raise the money and spend the money in places where we think the campaign is not doing it. And I'll give you a simple example. Our community, the AANHPI communities, basically 38 countries, hundreds of languages. It's small and scattered, but yet it's uh, proportionate. There's a mosque in Detroit, represented by city councilman Scott Benson. He organized a community hall meeting, and there were 300 people from Bangladesh and West Bengal in that room. And we had people who could speak Bengali. I, but the campaign could never have thought of doing that, okay? We have to think of doing that. Um, we have another community uh, that has a Burmese center where 150 people from Burma showed up, Burmese Americans, all potential voters, and the lieutenant governor went and visited with them and spent an hour and took hundreds of photographs. All I can tell you is we have to look at our community differently than a broad national campaign is going to. It's hundreds of different parts sliced and diced by generation, by date of birth, by everything. We have to do some of that work for them, but they're doing much more than any campaign has ever done before. I.e. we're getting better, but are we still satisfied? Hell no. <laughs> Shaker, there are a number of questions for you in the chat, and I hope you could just stick on for a few minutes and answer those questions. Um, we move on next to Christine Chen, who will discuss some of the key findings from the Asian American Voter Survey, which was released in July. I believe uh, many of you have seen the AABS, but uh, we welcome Christine to discuss uh, the findings as they relate to voting. Welcome, Christine. Great, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, API Vote, for those of you who don't know, we're the nation's leading um, nonprofit focusing on building political power by increasing voter and civic participation. We really do that by really investing in local nonprofits and the infrastructure there. Um, so the exciting news is that some of the trends that we're seeing is that even starting in um, 2020, 
Um, AAPI registrants are growing at a rate of 1.28 times larger than the Asian American Pacific Islander citizen voting age population. In other words, 18 years and older and U.S. citizens. We do know that Target Smart in the next few weeks will be releasing new data on voter registration. Um, I've been promised that there is going to be some interesting information about the AAPI registration rates. So we're really um, anxious to actually look at that. But this is what what is showing us is that since 2020 that our community is continues to actually be engaged in our uh, registering. We have a lot of catch up to do because in 2020 I used to say only half of our family and friends were registered and ready to vote, but now we're actually seeing that shift because in 2020 we saw that 60% actually turned out. The other exciting trend that we're seeing is that in 2020 21% of the voters that um, uh, the Asian American voters that um, turned out were first time voters. That was even higher in battleground states where you saw like in Georgia, 26% of the API's uh, voters uh, for, were first time voters and in Nevada, it was 25%. Um, and we actually saw that increase across the board across all the um, presidential battleground states as well as other states as well. The other thing um, I really want to point out is that how does that actually um, um, turn out in terms of us being a margin of victory? I know Shekhar talked about this a little bit more, but I want to go ahead and talk about Georgia as an example. So back in 2020, Biden won um, the Georgia, the margin of victory was less than 12,000 votes. The number of APIs who voted in 2020 in Georgia was over 142,000, knowing that 26% were first-time voters. If you do the math, that's about 39,000 voters, three times the margin of victory, right? So these are concrete ways and numbers that we're seeing um, where we actually are making a difference. Now, when it comes to our Asian American voter survey, we're also seeing that there is a lot of um, uh, you know, excitement. And this is, you please note that this, um, Asian American Voter Survey was actually conducted earlier um, in April and May. So this was obviously before um, Kamala Harris declared. Uh, we will be having another um, Asian American Pacific Islander Voter Survey being conducted by API Vote and um, API Data that will be coming at, out at the end of September with um, new information. But you know, I think this actually still gives us um, some interesting insights. 90% of our community um, continues to plan to vote. Uh, we also know that back in 2022, 73% of our community um, decided to vote early or by mail. And this time through our survey, we're seeing that 51% are planning to vote in person, um, but then 46% are still planning to vote by mail or to drop it off. Um, we think that number is going to continue to increase as we continue to educate our voters about the different options and how they can actually do that. Now, in terms of party identification, we've um, we continue to see some shifts, um, but still primarily Democrats are um, still winning over the Asian American voters at 42%. 31% are independent voters, and now 22% identify as Republican. Now, when you actually um, take those who are saying that they're independent and ask them if they lean one way or the other, um, the Democrats actually gain about to 51%, and then um, independents actually um, get smaller to 19%, and then 28% um, identify as Republicans. Chinese, Indian, and Japanese Americans are the top three ethnic communities that highly identify as Democrats and Vietnamese Americans um, actually lean more Republican. But this time around, we're also seeing that 42% nationwide Vietnamese are identifying as Democrats, 37% as Republican. So um, the other thing I do want to go ahead and know is a little bit about outreach is that still even earlier this year, only 42% um, say that they still were not contacted by the political parties. 50% said um, they were never contacted by Democrats and 57% um, said that they were never contacted by the Republicans. And that's why the work of what the C3, C4s, the PACs, all the different uh, entities are really important because these are all the different ways that we can engage the community to motivate them to turn out to vote. 
And then lastly, I want to end is regards to issue importance. Jobs and economy, healthcare, inflation, and crime continue to be the top issues, bread and butter issues. Right after that is education, social security, Medicare, and national security. Um, when we ask them about party evaluation between Democrats and Republicans, uh, one thing I want to note is that depending on the issue that they're talking about, it, it ranges from 24% to high of 42% saying that there's no difference between Democrats and Republicans. And that's why there's still a need for the political parties and the candidates to actually invest and do that work. For API Vote, we are investing this year close to $7 million. Um, with that, we are subgranting about $3 million to local partners. And then we're also using that to actually um, reach 2 million households, close to 2 million households with in-language um, in language mailers. That means there's 18 different languages, 36 different versions, and 23 key states. And then that will then be followed up with our um, partners with phone banking, text banking, and in some places, um, canvassing operations. And then we're also going to be investing in trans um, translated um, um, videos and agile digital ads where we will be geofencing certain areas to be able to service the proper um, in-language ads to the different communities. So looking forward to this conversation. Perfect. Uh, Christine, thank you so much. One key question before we move on to Mohan, what about the critical 18 to 34 uh, vote? Where are they? Well, I think that's why we're, we're what we've been hearing, you know, whether it's on the ground, but also um, I'm really anxious to hear from Target Smart because what what we've heard is that we there's an increase of 18 to 34 year olds registering, um, and so we're looking at and also women um, are actually registering at higher rates as well. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, in the interest of time, we are going to mo move on to Mohan Sishadri, who joins us from Pennsylvania. Mohan, welcome. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as Sunita said, my name is Mohan. I'm the executive director of APIPA, the Asian Pacific Islander Political Alliance. We're Pennsylvania's first and only statewide Pan-Asian 501c4 advocacy and political organization. We were founded by community leaders and community organizations all across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, representing uh, many of our diverse communities all across PA. Leaders and organizations who'd spent literal decades organizing at the grassroots level, at the neighborhood level, at the city level for Asian American political power and access to, to government, to democracy, and to justice for our communities, but who never had a single statewide pan-Asian political voice to speak through in the battleground state of Pennsylvania. When we launched in 2020, we doubled the Asian American vote in Pennsylvania, and that doubling provided fully half of President Biden's margin of victory in, in PA. In 2022, we ran a year long voter contact program, the largest in the country, uh, and were successful not just in electing the governor and uh, Senator Fetterman, but also in flipping the Pennsylvania State House along the way. And this year, uh, we're gonna once again uh, run the largest Asian American voter contact program in the country. Uh, we're gonna knock on 500,000 doors in 22 languages. We're gonna make 5 million phone calls in 22 languages. We're gonna send a million pieces of mail in the languages our communities speak uh, with the representation from our community leaders on it in order to meet every single member of our community where they are and make sure they, they know not just how to vote in this critical election, but also which candidates up and down the ballot are actually gonna to listen to and fight for our communities. So we're not just throwing down for Vice President Harris and Senator Casey. We also have 25 uh, state house, state Senate and congressional races all across the state that we believe is of critical importance to advancing the cause of Asian American political power and justice for our communities all across Pennsylvania. 
places where our Asian American community is the margin of victory, as other folks said, not just at the statewide level, as we are in PA these days, but also at the state house level, the state senate level, and congressional level. And there's real power to be built for our community through making sure that we're mobilizing our community in the 22 languages that our folks speak all across Pennsylvania for these down ballot races as well. Of course, we're a year round organization that's working in the community every single day, 365 days a year, which means while we have a year round voter contact election program that works at every level of the ballot all across the state in 22 languages, we're also laser focused on the issues affecting our community. Some of y'all may have heard about the Save Chinatown campaign, which fights to defend Philadelphia's Chinatown from destruction by three predatory developers who want to build a basketball arena on the edge of Philly's Chinatown and do a land grab of our 150-year-old community. So in addition to throwing down on the elections, right now this week with city council coming back into session, tomorrow we're mobilizing over 4,000 of our community members here in Philly to march on city hall and make sure that our uh, city council is hearing our voices and making sure that they don't put an arena in the heart of our city and they don't destroy Philadelphia's Chinatown process. And so that's the the task we have here in Pennsylvania. We have to walk and chew gum at the same time. We have to organize our community year round all across this huge state, the 700,000 Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who call Pennsylvania home. We have to fight for them on the issues. We have to mobilize them around, legisla around legislation that's gonna advance mental health access for our community. We have to fight off predatory development that's gonna devastate our ethnic neighborhoods and we have to mobilize them around elections to support candidates who are gonna to listen to and fight for our community. And that's why we're so committed to building deep Asian American political power all across the Commonwealth, because we're led by leaders who spent years in the community mobilizing our voters who know how to get this done. And we have a track record of success. We won in 2020, we won in 2022, and through our program this year where we've been on the doors for this election, since January 1st, and we're gonna be on the doors and on the phones and in people's mailboxes about the election until the election is done. And then we're gonna to mobilize to defend our democracy after that to make sure every vote gets counted. We're gonna make sure that we're gonna win Pennsylvania up and down the ballot for our candidates from our communities. We're gonna fight for our interests and make sure that our voices are heard in every part of government, in every part of Pennsylvania, as well as DC. Mohan, thank you. Um, a couple of questions have come up. Um, many news organizations have identified Pennsylvania as the state who's going to determine this election. Is that hype or do you see that happening? Um, no, it's 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 not hype. It's absolutely like Pennsylvania is the battleground of battlegrounds. It's where everything's going down. And that means that for our community, when we're the margin of victory, there's an intense opportunity to build local grassroots political power and resource long term organizations that are doing the work in our community day after day, year after year, who are already the trusted messengers for our community. That's why we're the largest Asian American voter contact program in the country, because Pennsylvania is so important. But we're able to turn that resource and that focus on us and our elections into year round political power that supports Chinatown, that supports the Vietnamese community in South Philly, that supports justice for Christian Hall and every other Asian American who's affected by mental health access and, and violence against our community. That's the task at hand in Pennsylvania when there is such a focus on us year after year, presidential cycle after presidential cycle. It's not just how do we raise and spend as much money as possible, it's how do we do it in a way that brings real political power to our communities on the ground along the way? How do we build organizations? How do we train organizers? How do we build leadership in our community? And that's what we're here to do. Thank you. There's one more question for you before we move on to Dr. Wen. To what extent are AAPI voters concerned about anti-China rhetoric? I would say deeply concerned. You know, we've, we've suffered immensely from the last four years of nonstop anti-Asian violence, anti-Chinese violence, but in a way that has spilled over into the Vietnamese community, in, into the Cambodian community, into the Indonesian community and the Korean community as well. And so I think our uh, community members, especially in Philly, where that violence has been especially stark uh, and noticeable, they're especially concerned about this anti-China rhetoric because they see the direct material impact 
uh, on our communities on the ground. Of course, our communities are incredibly diverse. And so it's important to know that while many of our East Asian communities, for example, are concerned about Chinatown and this anti-China rhetoric, our Southeast Asian communities are getting hit so hard by an intense increase in deportations. Deportations of Southeast Asians in Pennsylvania, especially the Cambodian community and the, uh, these refugee communities have tripled, almost quadrupled in the last year. This de uh, these deportations and the targeting of our Southeast Asian communities in Pennsylvania was a critical reason why traditionally Republican constituencies like Viet uh, Vietnamese Americans uh, voted blue in 2020 in Pennsylvania, voted for Biden in 2020 because they saw the way Donald Trump's ICE department targeted our Southeast Asian communities uh, for deportation and came to South Philadelphia in order to do that targeting. But we're incredibly concerned that if the Biden administration continues on this path that they're on right now, they're going to lose our votes. And so in addition to mobilizing our voters for Kamala Harris, we've also called on the Biden-Harris administration to, to shift course when it comes to supporting our immigrant and refugee communities not just for the moral and ethical and justice reasons of our communities deserve dignity and our families deserve to be whole in the places where they grew up, but also because we can't afford to lose a single vote in the battleground state of Pennsylvania. And every vote, every one of our voters is going to count this year. And our Southeast Asian voters are going to be voting based on their families remaining whole. Our West Asian voters are going to be voting based on what's happening in Gaza and the Middle East. And we need our elected officials and the candidates we're backing to hear those voters and make sure that they're being accountable to them, shifting course when it's necessary in order to earn our people's votes. Mohan, thank you so much. Uh, our next guest is a familiar face, Dr. Tung Wen, who shepherded us through two years of the COVID pandemic. But I want to stress here to reporters that Dr. Wen joins us here in his personal capacity as president of Pivot, and he will share his organization's unique strategies for engaging Vietnamese American voters. Dr. Wen, welcome back. Thank you, Sunita. Uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, I'm representing Pivot, the Progressive Vietnamese American Organization, and we're a national org uh, working to engage and empower Vietnamese Americans for a just and diverse America. Uh, historically, as you've heard from Christine, uh, the Vietnamese American voting population has been the most conservative among the ANHPI communities, partly due to past association of the Republican Party with anti-communism. Uh, many of us in the community, however, thought two things uh, back in the mid-2016, uh, 2017. Uh, one was that this was an outdated perception of the Vietnamese American electorate because uh, the more moderate, liberal, progressive people were much quieter. And then two, that those of us who were not conservative needed to rally and create a supportive community, as well as the elect candidates that are actually good for Vietnamese Americans. And that's how Pivot was born. Uh, since then, we have worked really hard uh, to keep our community informed. Uh, there is rampant mis- and disinformation in our communities, both in English, but especially in Vietnamese, uh, with much of that bad content coming out on YouTube. Uh, we created an, a, a, a project called Viet Fact Check, which is a nonpartisan information service in, that has really served as a model for bilingual anti-disinformation work in Asian American communities. Electorally, we have also engaged in uh, work through our 501c4 and super PAC arms. Uh, in 2020 and 2022, we implemented a massive bilingual uh, ad campaign online in English and Vietnamese uh, to uh, persuade voters in swing states. And our ads reach hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese Americans, including many on conservative platforms. Uh, we also collaborate on the ground with local API organizations such as Mohan's, uh, by helping them with their Vietnamese materials and outreach through our Pivot Fellows programs, uh, which embedded young Vietnamese American activists in organizations that have local know-how. Our fellows made hundreds of thousands of voter touches. We are using the same model, uh, this bilingual digital online campaign and on the ground voter engagement this year. Uh, we recently conducted some focus groups with these voters to understand where they are coming from and what we learned was that many young Vietnamese American voters are all in on Harris, but some are holding back primarily because of the situation in Gaza. 
We are also learning that some older Vietnamese American voters who use to support Trump are either less vocal about him or less enthusiastic about him or have been turned off by him, mostly uh, not around policy issues, but around character issues. And this seems to have started with the insurrection uh, in January, 2021. And these focus group findings reflect what we saw in the survey data presented earlier by Christine Chen. Uh, the Vietnamese American electorate is shifting from majority Republican and Trump supporters to a toss up between Republicans and Democrats. Uh, with a significant portion of around 25% who are independent that can still be persuaded. We're gonna use all of this information as well as engage our network of volunteers to engage Vietnamese American voters. Our, our fellows programs are in Michigan, uh, in Pennsylvania, in Nevada, Arizona. Uh, and with the shifting of the map, we're gonna hope to have one in Georgia as well. We are planning to send out 100,000 postcards to Vietnamese American voters. Uh, and we have developed our digital ads and uh, are disseminating them. And our goal is to reach every single Vietnamese American voter online or through v traditional Vietnamese media with ads in English and Vietnamese many times over. Uh, we believe, as many in this press conference have said, that Asian Americans, ANHPIs, and Vietnamese Americans are the margin of victory in the swing states. Uh, but that in order to win their votes, we need to reach them where they are, whether it is in person or online, in the languages they speak, and by reaching them with correct information about issues that they care about. Uh, the Vietnamese American communities matter and our votes matter. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Wen. There are a number of questions for you. Um, which of the strategies that Pivot has implemented can be successfully implemented by other communities attempting to engage with low propensity voters? Uh, I think the the, uh, the sort of in-person strategy that we use uh, that I think is very useful, particularly in communities with a lot of different groups, is for us to support work in one group. So, for example, uh, we focus on Vietnamese American. Uh, for example, Mohan's group focus on all Asian American and API Victory Fund focus on all Asian American. And they do a good job, but they need help with particular individual groups. And that's where we come in and provide them with that extra expertise uh, to give them some sort of marginal help there. Uh, so I think by thinking about each community, I mean, I, I can imagine, for example, the, the Latinx or Latino and Latina community could be, we're not just working on people from Mexico. We're working on people from Puerto Rico, from Central America. Uh, we need that kind of segmentation because I don't think uh, thinking of our communities as monolithic, uh, whether it's Asians or Latino or black or whichever community, they're not monolithic. Um, some, some, some people are gonna be good at doing some things than other. I think online, I think it's a very effective way as long as you know what you're doing in terms of tailoring the messages and, and the, the people uh, telling them about the, the issue. I do really think that you know, in a very nonpartisan way, uh, there's just a lot of misinformation out there. We just have to get the right information and, and trust our people to do the right thing. Uh, there's not another question for you. How potent is the crime issue? Crime has fallen, but the perception is that it's rising. How do you address disinformation about crime, specifically hate crimes, which have so impacted our communities? Yeah, no, I, I think uh, hate crimes and anti-Asian hate crimes in particular uh, has been an incredibly important and powerful force in driving people um, to uh, vote uh, because they care about themselves and their family and the safety of everyone. I, I think the way to think about it is that um, there are two different ways of thinking about crime. One is just crime in general and one is hate crime. Crime in general, uh, and certainly in many places are actually on the trend downward, not upward. So I think it's important to uh, be accurate about that information so that not to unnecessarily frighten people. Uh, on the other hand, hate crimes are on the rise and therefore we have to address that by saying, well, what are the causes of hate crimes? Why are we so afraid? And that would be xenophobia. Uh, and that would be gun violence and lack of lung, gun control uh, among and sort of white supremacy. I think if we are looking at the right target, so rather than saying, well, I'm afraid of crime, therefore we should you know, hire more police officer, which isn't a necessarily unreasonable approach. We should think about if I'm worried about anti-Asian hate, uh, what are the things that are making anti-Asian hate go up? <laughs> and then think about how we can do that and address that through our votes. Thank you so much, Dr. Wen. Before we move on to Dr. Zarda Diaz, 
Uh, Anjana Nagarajan Bhutani has a very important question that I think Christine Chen might be able to answer. Uh, Anjana, could you please ask your question? Hi, uh, this is a question for anybody who wants to take it. Uh, the statistics show us that the number of Americans who identify as biracial or multiracial is increasing quite rapidly. How do they vote or lean politically? Um, I'm curious. Thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, there is not um, specific data on that. Um, there are very few surveys. That, so that's one thing that we're still trying to get the media outlets and those that actually poll um, uh, voters to actually be able to do that. Um, it, it is also, um, and so right now, even with our Asian American voter survey, um, we're taking the top six uh, largest Asian populations that represent about 85% of the demographic um, um, until we're able to get better data identification of the voter files for the smaller ethnic communities, as well as uh, more funding. That's the only way we can actually dig deeper. Um, I do know Pew has been doing a lot more survey data, not necessarily just about voters. So you may want to take a look at that as well. Christine, there's another uh, question for you uh, about uh, uh, the AABS. Um, how concerned are Asian Americans uh, with border issues, especially as we see the number of immigrants coming across via the borders, undocumented immigrants coming across borders uh, who are from Asian countries? Are you asking about oh immigration in yes. general? Yes. Oh, got it. Okay. Um. So right now, right now that at least according to our Asian American voter survey, um, they feel that Republicans at 33% are doing a little bit better than Democrats at 28% on in terms of immigration. Um, oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. 35% is um, Republicans are doing better, 33% for uh, Democrats, but 24% still say there's no difference. So okay. you still have a large segment where there's still not enough differentiation between the two. Got it. We move on next to uh, Dr. James Sardas Diaz, who is going to uh, talk about the roots of Asian American conservatism. Welcome, James. Thank you, Sunita, and thank you, uh, everyone, for being on this call. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, uh, just a little bit of background. So I know a lot of folks um, on this panel, esteemed co-panelists, are representing PACs, nonprofit groups, um, voter outreach organizations. Um, I'm here as a historian, as an academic who is uh, who understand who's trying to get a better sense of the political landscape of Asian America. And I focus on contemporary Asian American history. And that's my training. I'm currently doing research and writing a book um, uh, tentatively called The Asian American Conservative. Uh, I recently wrote a piece in the LA Times, an op-ed in July uh, that talks a little bit about Asian American conservatism, not necessarily about the Republican Party, but uh, Asian Americans who lean right or have flirtations with the right, whether that is in within the GOP or otherwise. Um, and so um, I'm here today to kind of talk a little about the contemporary history. I think it's important, especially for journalists, to understand uh, maybe why shifts have occurred, why there's a swing to the left, sometimes a swing to the right. And I think this is really important context when you're doing your stories. And a lot of you know this as well, but I think it's really good to kind of have a refresher on that contemporary history to understand now where we are in the 2020s. So um, a little bit of some turning points. And of course, there's wonderful data like Christine knows and other folks on this call about Asian American voting, voting habits, AA. Uh, NHPI voting habits over time. Uh, but I'd say that as a historian, um, really the major turning point in terms of Asian American, the Asian American electorate occurred in the 1990s. Um, up until the year 2000, in terms of presidential elections, uh, Asian American voters uh, leaned right. Uh, so for example, as most the most recently in terms of when Asian Americans voted for Republican candidate, 1996 was the most um, recent example slightly voting in favor of Bob Dole over Bill Clinton. 1992, there was a larger margin of victory for George H.W. Bush among Asian American voters. 2000 turned things around where Al Gore received the majority of Asian American voters' um, support. And I'd say in the 1990s, a lot of this is occurring, this shift is occurring for a few reasons. 
uh, for first, for example, in California, where you have a large Asian American Pacific Islander uh, population, um, the rhetoric around immigration and uh, particularly Prop 187 was a turning point. Uh, and kind of the Republican Party at the time, especially in California, was seen as very um, taking a hard right turn in terms of issues of uh, document uh, undocumented immigrants and so forth. Um, the fear of the fear and the rise of China, so to speak, right, uh, and just East Asia as a whole, and increased um, investments, especially on the West Coast, um, where it felt more um, uh, uh, prominent. So fears about China, but even Hong Kong investments from Taiwan. You saw a, a wave of anti-Asianism and fear of Chinese people and Chinese presence uh, in the United States in the 1990s. In the meantime, the Republican parties I'm finding in my research um, kind of goes back and forth in terms of outreach towards Asian American voters. There was a, sw a swing towards reaching out to them uh, more actively in the early 1990s, and that starts to dissipate and decline uh, in the middle part of the 90s and certainly by the 2000s. And so while that's happening, as the GOP is not investing as much in Asian American voter outreach, uh, the Democratic Party, on the other hand, is doubling down in investing in Asian American outreach. And that's um, embodied in, for example, when Bill Clinton does more uh, appointees of Asian Americans in his administration, uh, in the courts, and through the bureaucracy and other spaces of government, where that representation is, is seen, right, within the Asian American community, and they notice that. And then lastly, I'd say in the 1990s, this shift occurs because in the in the mid 1990s, the Republican Revolution in 1994 with Newt Gingrich and the kind of um, groundswell of support of uh, Republican Party politics in the Sun Belt in particular, and uh, really kind of shifted the priorities of the party. Uh, and for some Asian Americans, they were turned off in the Republican Party's positions on uh, social issues, for example, abortion or maybe education um, and Im uh, immigration as well. And that kind of, again, uh, a, kind of made um, some Asian Americans question their loyalty to the Republican Party. And of, ever since you've seen, as you know, the data, they trend Democratic or are independents that lean left, right? A couple of other things to note in terms of contemporary history um, is that I would say in this kind of post-2015 post 2016 Republican Party um, and conservative conservative politics, I wouldn't say that GOP activism within the Asian American community is is climbing significantly. It's definitely there, and you see them throughout the United States. Um, but I would say that there's also a lot of registered Asian American Democrats who are starting to move more right. So they're voting for maybe center left or more moderate Democrats as opposed to um, backing folks who are more liberal, more progressive. We see that here. I'm based in San Francisco. We see that in some of the recent elections, uh, the voting out of Chesa Boudin, the progressive district attorney. You saw a lot of uh, Asian Americans in the city who are registered Democrats who uh, did not appreciate uh, some of the uh, teaching uh, that was seen as controversial of critical race theory or things that were seen as anti-American and they voted out school board members. And you're seeing that in other parts of the United States too, in places like suburban Virginia. Um, the Supreme Court decision that came out around affirmative action, also a touchy subject within the community where a lot of AAPIs feel um, uh, disenfranchised from uh, particularly admissions in colleges and universities. And I'd say the COVID-19 pandemic was a, a huge turning point. Obviously, you saw the rise of anti-Asianism and a lot of Asian Americans, particularly in urban areas, felt um, a lack of support from, um, from government leaders, the police, and feeling that the kind of quote unquote soft on crime and, and soft on hate crimes in particular kind of made them question democratic leadership. Uh, and so you start to see these movements. I wouldn't say there's a huge swing suddenly and, and, and groundswell of uh, Asian Americans registering now as Republicans, but you start to see these more moderate factions emerge and, and maybe questioning their loyalties to the Democratic Party or at least progressive politics. So uh, I'll just kind of keep it at that. I know we want to keep to time, but um, I, I would love to uh, engage with you if you uh, have any questions about the kind of contemporary history of Asian American conservatism. And I think, you know, as we'll see, um, you know, the AA, uh, NHPI vote is going to be really critical in places like suburban Atlanta, suburban Las Vegas, the Research Triangle, North Carolina,
China, where there's a lot of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders who could really determine outcomes of gubernatorial elections, congressional districts, senator, Senate races, and of course, the presidential uh, race as well. So I'll leave it there. Thank you for having me. Thank you, James. Such important information. Um, our last speaker today is Republican strategist Rena Shaw. Rena, welcome. Hi, Sunitha. Thanks for having me here. It's really nice to be with all of you. I had a couple observations I wanted to share with you all today, and particularly given there's so much talk about never Trumpers in the Republican Party today. But what I really wanted to start with is talking about who's identifying as independent anymore. And there's been a pretty big shift there. According to a 2024 um Excuse me, I'm so sorry. I think I might have gone off screen for a moment. Apologies. Uh, so according to a 2024 Pew Research Center report, about 40% of Asian Americans now consider themselves independent. That's up from around 33%, which was just a few years ago. So for either party to really win over this voting block, they need to focus on a few key things. First, they need to address issues that resonate with AANHPI communities. Um, those issues are immigration reform, education, and particularly economic opportunity. A 2023 survey from the Asian American Political Alliance found that 65% of AA and AHPIs are most concerned about economic policies and educational equity. Keyword, because we don't talk about equity much in the Republican Party these days. That's thought to be something that's left to the left. But secondly, both parties really, more than anything, need to engage more directly with this AA and AHPI communities through not only targeted outreach, but also by addressing specific local concerns. And that could involve hosting community events, working with local leaders, and creating policies that address the unique needs of these diverse groups. So in short, what I'm saying here is to court the growing independent AA and AHPI vote, it's going to take a mix of relevant policy focus as well as genuine engagement. Now, in my time with the Republican Party at the federal level, I had also been deeply engaged at the Republican National Committee. And through the Republican National Committee, that's where you see uh, the efforts out of that co-chair's office, again, within the campaign apparatus, uh, primarily targeted for um, congressional level and federal level candidates. You, you've seen for decades an understanding that there needs to be genuine engagement, but the criticism always has been, and this is just for Republicans, that Republicans have come courting that Asian American vote vote at the 11th hour. So always in the year of a presidential contest. So uh, the question I'm getting the most right now is, will Republicans continue to vote for Republican candidates in the down ballot races, even if they vote for Harris Walls? I, I love this question so much because it's one that I get every other day right now. But to that, I'll just say this. Um, if Republicans decide to vote for Harris or Walls in the top races, it doesn't automatically mean they're going to ditch Republican candidates down ballot. Historically, voters have often split their tickets. They've supported different parties for different offices. Like, for example, in 2020 elections, many voters chose Biden uh, for president, but they still supported Republican candidates for Congress. So exit polls from that year show that about 9% of Biden voters still backed Republican candidates for House seats. And I realize it's a really almost insignificant number, but it means something. If we look at the upcoming races, it's likely that a similar pattern is going to continue. Uh, in a 2024 Gallup poll I saw, uh, there was a suggestion that about 15% of voters are dissatisfied with their party's presidential candidate. They, and they might still stick with their party, but they might still stick with their uh, party for down ballot races. So at the end of the day, what I'm really want, wanting to leave you all with is that if Republicans are not thrilled with their presidential options, but they still align with party values, they might still support GOP candidates for other positions. And that's where I wanted to leave it. So I'm happy to take questions at this point. Absolutely. Uh, Rena, one question that comes in. Um, do you fear that Republicans are going to sit it out, given uh, you spoke about never Trumpers? Is that going to influence the number of people who just sit it out this time around? I've been very concerned about uh, the lack of political participation across some key demographics, but yes, very much so with Asian Americans in the aftermath of Kamala Harris becoming the nominee. Now, I realize that might surprise some folks, but there is a sentiment out there, and I don't know that it's widely held or that we have enough empirical evidence to back it up, but it's that she has chosen one side of herself versus another. 
instead of just being a biracial person that is allowed to embrace one side of herself when she's in certain rooms. And just because she's doing that doesn't mean she's rejecting this other side. But this assumption does carry some degree of weight with right-leaning voters, those who either are independently minded, center-right, or again, moderate ours who voted for Biden in 2020. Uh, those people are a bit lukewarm about her still. Of course, historically speaking, we've never seen a modern presidential candidate have such short period of time to conduct a real campaign. So in this reintroduction of herself that she's doing, uh, this is happening in real time. Strategists like me are looking at this and we see it going well. But what is at the end of the day going to matter? The numbers we see in seven states on Election Day, was she able to swing certain women, particularly white liberal, left-leaning women? Is she going to be able to get them to turn out and not stay home? Because these were the type of people, white liberals in particular, who were the reason that Hillary Clinton was not able to win that electoral college vote. And Kamala Harris might have something of the same problem uh, that might, re uh, might rely a little bit more on her identity versus anything else. And does uh, Tim Walls negate some of that? I have not uh, yet seen, again, any data that backs up my assertion that he has been negating some of it because he brings the Midwestern streak, which is not just a streak of um, sense and sensibility. It is a culture. Midwest has become a culture in the United States, and much like being a Southerner was in the United States. But what we've seen in, in the modern era is Floridians, for example, no longer introduce themselves as Southerners. They want to say, I'm a Floridian because they don't want to be grouped in with rural states such as Louisiana, Alabama, Arkansas. But Midwest, still in the year 2024, you do hear people saying, I'm from the Midwest. And therefore, those people feel a sense of, ah, there's a Midwesterner like me in walls. So yes, there's a bit of co counteraction here, but I don't have any kind of data to back this up. Thank you, Rena, for your remarks. Uh, we now move to uh, final remarks from all speakers who are still with us. Uh, Dr. Wen. Uh, what is the most important thing you'd like reporters to take away from this briefing? I think the most important thing is that there is a lot of enthusiasm in this election um, and we need to get uh, people out. And I think from the reporting perspective, I think it's important for you all to get accurate information out about the candidates. That's what we all ask for. Um, let them know. I, I love the issue focus uh, with Rena. I, let's get the, you know, where do they stand on economic policy? Where do they stand on immigration policy? Uh, that I, I trust our voters uh, as long as they get adequate information. Thank you. Mohan, your most important uh, takeaway. I think just to remember, uh, you know, for all the reporters out there, to remember the importance of talking to local organizations, talking to leaders on the ground, and you all do such amazing work on this already, but continuing to cover the local issues and the local fights affecting our community, not just uh, the election implications, not just the national implications, but what are the issues that our communities are mobilizing, protecting our people's homes, making sure that we have mental health access, making sure that our communities are safe, year round 24 seven. And of course, covering the local organizations who are fighting for candidates who are gonna be accountable to our communities, who are gonna to listen to our people and who are gonna fight for our communities. Thank you so much, Mohan. James. Yeah, I echo those sentiments and I'll, I'll just say as someone is doing a lot of research on this as well, is trying to also get um, the voices of uh, Asian American voters and, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander voters who um, maybe are not normally at the forefront of American politics. So what I mean is that, again, a lot of conservative voices out there too, that it's important to hear their perspective, even if you don't necessarily agree with their views, it's helpful in terms of understanding where the voters are and how to just generate and create, create better legislation. And, and to be more targeted with your outreach. So um, I'd say that um, those are important things and just vote. <laughs> so <laughs> be with you all. Thank you, James. Christine. 
Yeah, you know what? As we know, that our voters are motivated, but they need better information. Um, they need to know what's on their ballot. How can they research it? So anything that you can do to focus on the issues, um, where the candidates actually stand on different issues, um, and to also fight back on mis and disinformation that you, that you may be hearing. Um, and so that's a really important role. The other thing I, I also put in the chat is that I also welcome all the media outlets to help us celebrate National Voter Registration Day that's coming up on September 17th. Um, because many times we get calls on our um, Asian hotline on election day and they're like, how do I vote? I want to vote. And we ask them, are you registered? And they they never registered. So we don't want anyone to be in that predicament. So it's really the strength of your outlets and your networks and the information that you provide that can actually help prevent mis and disinformation and actually remind everyone about what is the process for registering to vote. Thank you. Thank you. Rena, last word. Sure. I, I think for me, the most important part is folks should not believe that uh, this election outcome will perhaps be determined on the night of or even the next day. Uh, and, and we should have hope in that and we should have faith in our institutions. And, and that can be done through journalism, instilling uh, and reinstilling that faith for people that our institutions work. They have survived. And though we are a young democracy, uh, it takes all of us who are here to be part of it and to make it work the way it needs to work. So I echo my, my co-panelists here who have talked about, you know, just really promulgating the importance of voting, um, but for people to know that their vote does matter. There's going to be a great deal of misinformation and disinformation continually um, just thrown at folks from various sources that are not you all. And so that's what my one request would be as a political strategist. I want everybody at the table. I want everybody participating and understanding their system. And that can really be done through the vehicle that you all provide. Uh, so please do reach out to me at any time if I could be an asset in, or uh, augment your work in any way. I'd, it'd be a pleasure. And thank you for having me and all of us here today. Thank you so much to all of our speakers today. And thank you, reporters, for joining us. We'll see you next Friday.